Greetings and welcome. Today in our continued look at graphs of trigonometric functions, we're talking specifically about a couple features where we'll be able to modify sine and cosine functions. We're talking about amplitude and period. Okay, so just like if I, uh, for instance, was teaching you about uh, the equations of parabolas, and if I only ever showed you y equals x squared, that wouldn't necessarily be a very interesting parabola, but there's ways of modifying parabolas, right? I could stretch it, I can smoosh it, I can shift it. Uh, and we're going to talk about a couple of the modifications uh, for sine and cosine, which are essentially going to be a vertical stretch and horizontal stretch or smoosh, respectively. Uh, so, for amplitude and period, let's start by talking about amplitude. Amplitude. All right. And the amplitude of one of our functions, either one really, uh, is going to look like this. So here's my standard position. Now, remember the plain old sine graph starts at 0, goes up to 1, goes down to 0, goes down to 1, goes up to 0. right? And these aren't technically semicircles, but uh, sometimes I'm okay if you somewhat approximate the graph that way. All right, something like that and like that. So there's our, our standard sine graph, something to that effect. Now a couple things regarding amplitude here that I want to talk about is uh, what would you say if I ask you what the average y value was for this graph? Like what's the average, what's the middle of the road for this graph? If you had to describe the Average y, what would it be? Because zero, right? I mean, it goes up as high as what positive one here in this case, and as low as negative one. But it seems like it would all kind of average out to just being zero, and that's exactly right. Uh, it turns out this horizontal line uh, at y equals zero in this case is referred to as the midline. All right, so kind of the the average outcome. Uh, you could consider that like kind of the midpoint between the high and the low, right, uh, is what you could view that as. So that's referred to as the midline. So when I describe the amplitude, uh, that is going to be uh, the distance from a max, or, or uh, well, maybe I'll just say an extreme point, extrema, to uh, the midline. All right, so the amplitude here that I'd be referring to is this distance right here. All right, so this would be the amplitude, right? Or similarly, this distance would be the amplitude. Okay, so um, that's, uh, and, and in general, uh, for a plain old sine function, uh, what would the value of the amplitude be in this case? What is the numerical value of this amplitude? One. Yeah, it would be 1, right? Because it goes from 0 to 1 or 0 to negative 1, still having a distance, so distance is positive. So the amplitude in this case is 1. Question, what would the amplitude of a cosine function be? A plain old y equals cosine x. Also 1, right? Because Cosine in that in their case starts at one, goes down to zero, uh, down to negative one, right? And cosine also happens to have uh, its amplitude being, you know, one there, one there, one there, is the idea, right? So um, amplitude is one. So a little formula, so to speak, for amplitude. Well, let me I guess specify uh, if I want to calculate amplitude. If I have y equals a times the sine of x or y equals the cosine, uh, or sorry, a times the cosine of x, then the amplitude is going to equal the absolute value of a. All right, so that's our kind of standard <coughs> formula there right there. And actually that's not uh, terribly unlike what we saw with parabolas. We knew that we were able to uh, kind of vertically stretch parabolas by multiplying our x squared term by 
you know, some value, and it would stretch it out. So A stands for amplitude, correct? Right? Yep, A is, yeah, more or less, yeah, you could view that as the amplitude. Now, notice that I have this specifically being the absolute value of A, and why do you think that absolute value is necessary? Right, because amplitude is a distance, so I wouldn't want it to be negative. Uh, so I guess that also brings the point that this a value could be negative. What do you think would happen if I graphed the, the graph of y equals negative 1 times sine of x? Here's graph of y equals 1 times sine of x, because the amplitude was 1, right? Uh, what would happen if it was a negative 1? What do you think would happen to this graph? Yeah, it'd just be flipped upside down, exactly. So negative uh, 1 sine of x would be kind of like that, where it just flips it, just like how a negative coefficient, leading coefficient for our parabolas back in the day just flipped our parabola upside down. All right, so notice there's kind of a lot of similarity there. Um, now, what, uh, what I will point out is there's actually another way to calculate amplitude, because not all the time will we necessarily have the formula. Maybe we'd start with a graph and not all the time will your midline happen to conveniently be at the x-intercept. Okay, uh, So let's suppose um, I happen to have some points here. Let's say that the coordinates of this point uh, what do I want to call this? I'll call this x1, y1 and let's say that the coordinates of this point are x2, y2. Not necessarily the notation that your text or other mathematicians use, but uh, just to make a point that another way I could calculate the amplitude if, say, I have uh, one of my max or mins, that the amplitude, uh, if I had this overall distance, okay, how, well, actually, first of all, how could I calculate this overall distance if I knew this point and this point? Well, the x values are the horizontal points. So it would be the difference uh, between these y values, right? And if this, if this y was negative, well, I'd have to you know, make it positive or whatever. Um, so it turns out that the amplitude, uh, this green distance, I could calculate by doing... Um, uh, I'll say y1 minus a negative y2 would calculate that distance. Um, and the amplitude, how would the amplitude relate to this green distance? What's your theory? Yeah, it's just going to be half of it, so I'm going to just divide this all by 2. So here's a, kind of another way to calculate the amplitude. If for some reason we, you know, only knew what the uh, coordinates or locations of our max and mins were at, uh, which sometimes will be the case, so it, it's good to be able to calculate it two ways. And then if I know this amplitude, and I know whether or not this was flipped upside down, I'd then be able to plug that into, you know, my equation if I was writing my equation. Uh, so, uh, so there's amplitude. Let me uh, pull up a graph here. Do 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 do. And here's a graph of a uh, kind of standard sine curve. Notice I've got a whole uh, a bunch of other variables in play here. Um, but uh, for us, uh, I'm specifically looking at the A value. And notice that when A is 1-ish, okay, we're calling that 1-ish, uh, that the amplitude happens to be at 1, right? The heights of these are 1, negative 1, 1. And so the amplitude, the distance from the midline to the... Uh, extrema is 1. And notice if I change this a value, notice if it increases, it's actually increasing uh, those heights or extreme values, right? So if a is around 3-ish, notice now this is at 3, this is at negative 3, right? Uh, if a is bigger than that, it's, it's completely corresponding to those values. Now if a is less than 1, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, it's just going to smoosh it. So, for instance, if A is a half, notice that now the heights are at 0.5 and negative 0.5, right? And if A is negative, uh, Christiana said earlier she suspects that it's going to flip, and notice that is exactly what happens. So here's, for instance, a negative 1A, and now it's, it still has the same amplitude, 
right? The distance is still 1, but what's happened to the graph is instead of sine starting at 0 going up to 1, it's going down to 1, and it's just flip-flopped the whole thing, right? And you can also get uh, more extreme amplitudes also with a, a negative resulting in a flip. All right, so that's kind of uh, the first concept that we've got going. And the same thing occurs for cosine, by the way, uh, if I graph that and change the value of A. So the other thing I want to talk about is what's uh, called the period. All right, now this period is supposed to be at 2 pi. Uh, clearly, it's not quite landing on the right spot. And the period is going to be related to the coefficient of my x on the inside. Um, and there's going to be ways for me to kind of stretch and shrink it. But let's uh, talk about period first of all, if I want to modify the period. Um, so to calculate the period, oh, period, right? Uh, if I have y equals sine of, our book uses k times theta or k times x. Uh, yeah, we'll stick with that for now. Uh, k theta or kx, I'll use x in this case. Or if, or if y equals uh, cosine of k times x. All right, so I'm multiplying those respectively by some coefficient on the inside. All right, so multiplying the outside of these functions by our a value stretched them vertically, multiplying them on the inside by a value is going to horizontally affect them. But what's interesting is that it might be kind of the opposite of what you'd first expect. So for instance, if I wanted to graph what y of sine of 2x was, um, the 2 isn't going to actually double the period, which is weird. You'd think maybe it would stretch it by a factor of 2, but in fact, it will smoosh it uh, by a factor of two or cut its uh, period in half. And the reason that happens is, well, if you think about, imagine if I had sine equals uh, 2x, before I go any further here. Uh, if x is pi, all right, right, if x is pi, I'm getting the value of sine of 2 pi all the, already occurring when x was pi. All right, so what's happening is it will cycle through its x values much quicker, all right, is what would occur. So if I plugged in like pi over 2 for x, and I had 2 there, that at pi over 2, I'm actually getting the value of pi for sine. So um, it, it ends up doubling the rate at which it goes through its oscillation, all right, therefore halving or halving the, the period as a result. So I would say the period, I often, I, I, call, I use the variable p, is going to equal 2 pi divided by k is our formula for period, all right? Uh, 2 pi divided by k. So if k is 2, as I said, it would cut your period in half. If k, how would you get the period to be larger? Yeah, k would have to be a, a fractional value less than 1, right? So if k was a half, and I divide by a half, that would in fact double the period, giving me 4 pi. All right, so um, definitely worth kind of pointing that out. And let's see how this behaves on the sketch. If I change the value of b to a bigger number, notice it's actually horizontally smooshing it, right? And my period is getting smaller and smaller. Uh, so notice if B is 6, it's actually going through this cycle uh, 6 times in the regular 2 pi distance, meaning the period is now 1 sixth of 2 pi, all right? Or if B, like I said, was 2, notice it's going through one full cycle in pi radians rather than 2 pi radians. And if we half, uh, let's see, have numbers that are smaller than 1, notice it's stretching it. So if b is 0.5, notice it's only halfway through its cycle by the time it gets to 2 pi, and it actually wouldn't complete uh, until 4 <coughs> pi. So the smaller these get uh, to 1, uh, they end up, or all between 0 and 1, the smaller they get, 
the further it stretches out the period. Okay, And this is going to be helpful for us when we, we start using these functions to model real-world data. So for instance, if I was modeling, say, the, the uh, lunar cycle, uh, the lunar cycle is a 28-day cycle. So I would end up wanting to stretch out the period from 2 pi, which is 6.28, to some number that's going to give me 28 instead of 2 pi. Uh, and that's what I would end up having to do. I'd have to change the value of the coefficient of the x. And what happens when this goes negative? It actually ends up doing a similar flip, uh, which is interesting enough right there. Uh, and actually, you might think this looks a lot like the, a vertical flip, doesn't it? In fact, it's identical to a vertical flip for sine, if I have a negative 1 on the inside, which is quite interesting. Uh, We'll talk a little bit later about uh, trigonometric identities in the next uh, chapter, next course even in our case, um, where it turns out that sine of a negative theta is equal to negative sine of theta. And that's not true for all trig functions, but that does happen to be true here. Uh, and so actually what's really interesting is I could have negative sine of negative x and end up getting a regular old sine function if both of those were negative, which is really weird to think about. But, uh, but anyways, so I just want to point out that that's how kind of those behave. It's like a cool spring or something. So, uh, so let's actually do some problems with uh, amplitude and period. Let's do this. So here's an example. And I'm going to have a couple little tricks to help us graph on paper. Uh, to make this a little easier. So let's see, let's say I want to graph the equation y equals cosine of theta divided by 2. Okay? y equals cosine of theta divided by 2. So first question, uh, what is the amplitude here? <coughs> well, what's the number outside the cosine here? There's a 1 right there. So the amplitude would be the absolute value of 1 or 1, right? And what is the period? The period is equal to, well, what's that k value? It's technically 1 half is the value of that k. It's being multiplied by theta. So uh, the period is going to be 2 pi divided by k, which is 1 half, right? I guess I could even write that k equals 1 half if you really want. Or you could write that a was equal to 1 if you want to use that and incorporate that into our formulas for these respective calculations. You could. Uh, so what is 2 pi divided by a half? No. It turns out it's 4 pi. 2 divided by a half is, oh. dividing by a half is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, which would be 2 over 1, right? And that's doubling when you divide by a half. So uh, my amplitude is 1, and my period is 4. So when I graph this, 4 pi, sorry, way different than 4. When I graph this, all right, so uh, I didn't do any shifts. We're not doing shifts yet, don't worry. So it's still going to have a midline at y equals 0. Uh, how high and how low is this going to go? 1 and negative 1, right, because the amplitude was still 1. And instead of being 2 pi for one full period, now my period is 4 pi. Okay? So I'm going to draw just one cycle of this cosine function. But now 4 pi is how far out I'm going on the x-axis as a result. And now in order to get the other points of interest, I want to kind of divide 4 pi into quarters. So the halfway mark is 4 pi divided by 2, which is 2 pi. The half of the halfway mark, or the quarter mark, is 2 pi divided by 2, which is pi. And then the 3 quarter mark is just 3 of those. And you might think that was a really weird way of describing 1, 2, 3, and 4 pi's, respectively. Um, but that technique of going from the largest to the half to the quarter to the 3 quarter um, will be helpful when we have <coughs> fractional numbers that aren't whole numbers like this.
And now the general shape for cosine is all I have to consider at all five of these significant points. Cosine, remember, uh, cosine at zero. What is cosine at zero? One, right? Cosine starts at one, right? Cosine of zero radians or degrees happens to be one. So it goes from uh, one to zero to negative one to zero to positive one. And then I'll just draw the curve somewhat in there. And sometimes I'll even draw each little quartile of the curve, if I could use that word, uh, one quartile at a time. And yeah, so there's my cosine function. So what's interesting is uh, for this chapter, my graphs actually will always look the same. This cosine graph will look the same as most of the other ones, unless it was flipped. Uh, the only thing I'm doing is changing my scale, uh, which is I find amusing. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of like cheating. So the shape of the graph, so I technically, I could just hand you a piece of paper with a whole bunch of cosine functions, all exactly the same size, and really all you'd have to do is change what the scale is for these uh, is what you'd end up having to do if if all the problems happen to be cosine functions that weren't flipped. Uh, so let's see. Let's let's consider another one. Let's graph the following. Uh, y equals one half sine of four times x. I'll use x instead of theta this time. So, uh, I guess in this case, let's figure out what A and K are first, and then we'll find the amplitude and period. So let's see, what's A? Yep, a half. What's K? Four. So the amplitude is going to be the absolute value of a half, which is a half. And the period is going to equal 2 pi divided by 4, right, divided by the value of K, which what's that simplify to be? Yeah, one half pi or pi over two. So now I'm just going to draw my scale. And making these problems easy is all about just picking the right scale. And then your problem ends up being able to graph real nice. Uh, so how high up do I go and how low do I go? Up a half and up negative a half. Right? And how far over do I need to go? Pi over 2 this time will be one full cycle. So let's see if I can find divide this pi over 2 into quarters. Half of pi over 2 is? Pi over 4. Yep. Half of pi over 4 is? Pi over 8. And then my 3 quarter mark is just going to be 3 of these, right? So what's 3 pi over 8s? 3 pi over 8, <laughs> right? So see how uh, just by choosing to go kind of in that sequence, it ends up being really easy. Uh, the three-quarter mark is usually the harder one to find, and that's why I recommend kind of doing that little, little pattern. So let's see. Uh, now this is a sine function, so I'm not starting up at the maximum value. I'm starting where? Sine of zero is zero, and sine will go up to its max, back down to zero, down to its min, and back up to zero. And now I just draw my nice little curve, and I call it a day. Right, not bad, not bad. So there's one more type of example that we've got to know how to do, which is what happens if I use some of these facts in reverse? What happens if I give you an amplitude and a period and I want you to write an equation for me? Or if I gave you a graph, I want you to find the amplitude and period and write the equation for me, right? So that's the other you know, way that we might encounter these. So let's look at one of those right now. And hopefully as a result of doing this, we're becoming more familiar with just graphing sine and cosine functions in general. So let's see, write uh, the cosine, func or cosine function uh, that has amplitude 
an amp I guess I'll I'll be proper an amplitude of 9.8 and a period of tell you what I want to make this interesting a period of 10 not 10 pi 10 uh -huh. so in order to do this now I know in general I'm gonna have a function that looks like this y equals a times cosine of k x right I know that my graph my equation is gonna look like that what do I currently know I know that the amplitude is equal to 9.8 I know that the period all right is equal to 10 so if I want to figure out what the values of a and k are well, I'm gonna have to use this in reverse now a could technically be positive or negative 9.8 right because a is or, or amplitude is the absolute value of a so a is going to be plus or minus 9.8 but now I've also got to figure out what uh, the value of k is. Now the formula for period, I'm just going to plug in what I know and solve for what I don't. The formula for period, remember, is p equals 2 pi over k. So let's just plug in and, and solve. So period, I'm saying is 10. Let's see, I guess I'll use the right color here. Uh, so 10 is equal to 2 pi divided by k. So to solve that for k, what could I do? Couple. Yeah, you could divide by 2 pi, you could reciprocate, you could do a bunch of things. Uh, you could multiply both sides by k first. Let's just say we reciprocate first. Um, and it, no, none of the ways I described are wrong, it's all just a matter of preference. So uh, 1 tenth is equal to k over 2 pi, and then to get k by itself in this instance, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2 pi. And I'll get k is equal to 2 pi ten over 10, or pi over 5 is the value of k. Oh, that was a sad looking box. So my equation is going to be y equals plus or minus 9.8 times the cosine of pi over 5 uh, x times x, right? That's the idea. And this would be, well, there's, I have two equations here because I didn't specify whether it was flipped or not. Uh, two equations that happen to have that amplitude and the period of 10. And one of the things I think is interesting is that the period, uh, to have a period that doesn't have a pi in it, my k value must have a pi in it in order to kind of cancel out with the period which is typically 2 pi in, in radians. So, um, so that's the idea for this section. Thanks everyone for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.